This is Mario Andretti, and you are listening to Below the Yellow Line. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Below the Yellow Line, episode number 206 on tap this afternoon. And it is with great honor and pleasure I introduce to the show former NASCAR Cup Series driver, former NASCAR Cup Series winner, Jerry Nadu, to the studio today. Sir, thank you so much for joining the program this afternoon. How are you doing? Oh, you're welcome. Doing well, doing well. Absolutely. Great to have you on the show. I mentioned there in a little intro, you you drove in the Cup Series for a good amount of time. You won in the NASCAR Cup Series, but you had to have a start. You didn't just jump in a car and, and immediately start uh, winning, right? Every single driver has a path, a start in this sport. What was your start? When did you know you were first interested in motorsports, and what was your path to the Winston Cup Series eventually like? Um, mainly my father. My father was a local racer at the Danbury Fairgrounds in Danbury, Connecticut. And, uh, so yeah, I remember my mom carrying me in her arms at the racetrack, watching my dad race. We used to play with these little cars, uh, below the speedway in the back of the grandstands. There were maybe 10 inch plastic cars. We used to fill them up with rocks and we used to shoot them down the road. Um, but then my dad, my father bought me a go-kart around four years old. And uh, he brought me to the tracks around seven, and that was it. Um, I just took off. Uh, loved it. Um, didn't do very well in school, uh, but I, I know when things got bad, my dad would take the go kart away, and I'd have to bring bring my grades my grades back back up. Um, so yeah, racing has been a part of my life forever. Um, it was kind of heading towards uh, road racing, you know, kind of Formula One Indy cars, but then uh, it took a turn towards stock cars. So all in all, it was a, it was a good good road until the the accident. Yes, sir, it was. And one of those one of those big stops along the way, probably your most notable stop, at least in the Capture Gen way, was with Hendrick Motorsports. And this, I mean, of course, Hendrick's still a powerhouse in NASCAR today, but this is when they had Jeff Gordon fresh off his run with Ray Evan Hand. They had a two time champ in Terry Labonte. Jimmy Johnson was about to come in. What was it like? What was the culture like going to a place like Hendrick Motorsports? You know, Mark Martin said when he went from Roush to Hendrick that it was like working for NASA all of a sudden. What was it like? walking into that shop and seeing all these legendary drivers, seeing Rick Hendrick, what was working for Hendrick Motorsports driving for them like? Um, it was great. Uh, you know, I probably wasn't ready as a young driver. I, I think even though I spent a couple of years in, in cup, I wish I was a little bit more prepared and I had the right people behind me. Um, love those guys. I remember taking them out to lunch, but um, all in all, it was a really cool deal. I just don't know if I was ready. Um, you know, even though we won a race, we probably should have won five races. Uh, but I think, um, yeah, it just, it just didn't happen. Um, you know, I was there for a couple of years, then I finally got let go and the crew chief got let go. I got let go. Um, I, I don't know if I fit in a situation like Hendrick. I think, uh, you really got to. You know, I came up the hard way. Um, I didn't have the best of everything. Um, even though it was a great experience. Um, you know, at times I remember R Jeff would come by and, and and ask me, what are you doing? You know, because I was so much faster than him at certain tracks. And I think we just had a weird setup at times. Um, and then we took advantage of it, but we just never got to the end. Uh, except, uh, you know, Atlanta, the first year I was there, we were able to win. We should have won the following year, too, but we ran out of fuel. And I remember leading a bunch of races at Charlotte Motor Speedway, even the 600. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it was a good situation. I love those guys, but I'm not sure if I was really capable. I think I would have rather took the money, the sponsorship, and went to a, a, a more smaller team. It made something good out of it. Um, but all in all, it, it was a good deal. Glad, glad to get my first win with uh, with Rick. 
Well, speaking of that first win, take us through that because the driver's first win in any racing series, but especially the Winston Cup series, is always a very big deal. A lot has to go into it to win one race. Kind of take us through what you remember from that day, that race, and, and how nervous were you in those closing laps? You had a pretty decent lead, but still, I imagine those nerves had to be getting to you as you see those laps wind down, and eventually you see the white flag. Yeah, and this happened a lot. You know, even during the year, we there were so many races, Darlington, um, you know, rocking him, we had a great run and, and I remember Chicago dominant and a little 10 cent part took us out. So obviously we weren't thinking like we were going to win it. I mean, we were like, Oh my God, what, what is going to, well, something's going to happen. And uh, it never did. And uh, I remember Rodney Combs, my spotter was like, go cat, go, you got it. You got it. I'm like thinking, dude, shut up. Wait, don't say nothing because it's happened so many times during the year and we just didn't make it. But um, it, it was a good situation. It, it was meant to happen. We had a really good lead, dominant. You know, we called for outside Paul. We led a lot of laps. Um, we finally got the win. And the funny thing is we won on Monday. So if it was on Sunday, I think we would have broke something. But we won on Monday. It was an odd day. Nobody was really watching the race and we won it. So. It was meant to happen, but, um, yeah, um, you know, it was, it was a good deal. And, you know, unfortunately we were, we didn't make it happen at Hendrix and we had to, we got let go and went to a new team with, um, MB2 Motorsports. Well, the, the next year, you know, that race was on a Sunday and, you know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. It always seemed like something happened to you guys. You were so fast that following years Atlanta race, it's a spot a lot of drivers have been in. I've seen it as a fan and in media. So many drivers lose races on fuel mileage as a Dale Jr. fan. I'll never forget where I was the 2011 Coke 600. I'll never forget where I was at Las Vegas in 2014. And those races sting as a driver. What was it like to come back to attract the next year where you probably had the most confidence you'd ever had running the same race you dominated the year before you're so fast all day. You're leading with a half a lap to go. And then ultimately Bobby Labonte comes up from behind and steals it from you because you were half a lap short on gas. What was that whole last lap like going from jubilation to the agony of defeat in a few seconds i i was <laughs> i was used to it i figured something was gonna bite um yeah i don't i don't remember the whole race i i think we we had to start dead last or 42nd in that race i think and we just became dominant halfway through the race and led a lot of it and i don't remember I don't remember them ever tell me that we're going to be short on fuel. So um, it still kind of makes me mad. It, it kind of stings, you know, it would have been nice to get at least two wins uh, in the cup series. I know we won the shootout, uh, the noble shootout, which doesn't count as points, but it would have been nice to have two wins uh, from Atlanta. Um, but yeah, we're always used to it. Um, something had to happen, especially with a, a six second lead, you would think, God, something's got a bad, a bad got to happen. So obviously coming off of turn two, um, it just completely died and I was shaking the car and yeah, we coasted across the line. I think we got third, third or fourth. I don't remember, but we were coming across the line like 25 miles an hour. Um, yeah. So that yeah, it did sting. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> well, sorry about that. I imagine it would sting, uh, though, for a driver to be that close. I mean, that's the weird thing about auto racing that you you can't really have in, in other sports is you can't really have a, a 42 nothing lead in a football game with a minute left and then see that run out. But auto racing is just it is it is that way. It's it's it bites you like that sometimes. Um, and you mentioned it there. You know, you leave Hendrick Motorsports in 2001. You go over to MB2. And you guys were, were pretty darn fast there. That that was a, a pretty solid team at the time. I remember you won the pole, I think, for that a classic spring Darlington race in 2003. Oh, go ahead. Well, yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it was before then. I, I did go to the Petties. Oh, yeah. Okay. In 2002. And we, we ran really good at some racetracks. And then we went to Sonoma. And we qualified like 15th or 16th. And we led the last 20 laps. And I had, I had, again, another eight second lead and the plug, the plug came out of the rear end gear and we lost all the fluid and we broke the rear end gear 
going for the white flag. So, <laughs> so yeah, that that bit me. But we went to um, we went to Petty's, and then I got hurt. I was in a go karting accident. I was at at, at uh, Martinsville. Uh, we practiced really well, and at nighttime, my, my buddy um, w- lives up there, and he, he was having a go-kart race at his house, and I went over to the house, and I flipped, um, and I broke my shoulder blade. So that, that kind of took me out of the petties for the 2002, and then 2003, we, we got hooked up with MB2 Motorsports and the U.S. Army. And that was a that was a really fast car, you know. I think I, I watched back some of that season recently in, in the off season when I was bored and, and having some NASCAR withdrawals. And and you guys are faster. I remember that Darlington race that year. Uh, I, I watched that uh, Ricky Craven Kurt Busch finish a lot. I never really yeah. sat down and watched the full race. And and I looked and I said, that's that's Jerry Nadeau on the pole. That's Jerry Nadeau leading those laps. You guys had a really fast car. I think I think you got spun on like lap seven or eight. Never really got yeah. to show what you had. Yeah, I don't know if I got spun. I think I spun on myself. Um, I was I qualified second. I didn't. I never qualified on a pole. Although I looked, and I had um, in two thousand two, I qualified outside pole. No, actually, it was nineteen ninety nine. I qualified outside pole at Dover. But me and Rusty Wallace had the same time, but they gave it to Rusty <laughs> because Rusty did it first, and uh, I qualified outside pole. But yeah, I remember that year uh, in 2003 with the U.S. Army. We were really fast. And that's another thing. It was a 10 cent part on the oil um, where the distributor went. There was an oil pressure gauge that was broken and we leaked oil and we finally got uh, they black flagged us. So, yeah, that wasn't a good deal. Amazing how, you know, on a, on a multi-million dollar car with an engine and tires and a car that's engineered down to the tenth of an inch that a yeah. 10 cent part can take yeah. you out of contention. I mean, again, that's just how auto racing is. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And it's like that and anything, any type of professional sport, something stupid, something bad. <laughs> um, it, nothing. I don't think it, maybe it was already cracked. Who knows? Um, but. Yeah, you, there's a lot of mechanical things that can go wrong in stock car racing. Maybe not as much today, but back in the day, you know, in, in the early 2000s, uh, you know, people are doing a lot of things to get more horsepower out of these cars. We're pushing, you know, 900 horsepower. I, now I think they're they're using 650 horsepower. So you, we lost 300 horsepower from 2000 to now. Um, so, yeah, um, things happen. They sure do. And, and you say you've we've lost 300 horsepower. And this is the question I kind of circle like this is kind of the answer I want to know the most as somebody that that raced in Winston Cup and kind of had your best years in Winston Cup in the early 2000s, somebody that won then when you watch a race on TV now or maybe when you go to the track, what are the biggest differences? I mean, there's a lot of them. There's some similarities still. But as somebody, you know, I've only been watching for about a decade. I've only been you know covering the sport as as media for maybe two or three years now. What are some of the biggest differences as a driver that you see in these cars, how these modern day drivers drive these cars whenever you watch a race? Now, how different is the sport from when you were driving to, to what you see on track now? I think the racing's good. Um, I don't see anything wrong with it. I think it's, uh, you know, it's sad that, that you don't get nearly as many fans. I mean, we were at the high, you know, two, I think 2003, 2004, 2005 was like the high of NASCAR. Um, you know, I know the racing was good. You had a lot of really good drivers, a lot of big name drivers back then. We lost a lot of the big names. Um, but God, I think the racing's just as good. Um, you know, you've got the the Kyle Bushes, the the Kyle Larsons, you know, Denny Hamlins. Um, it's just different people. Yeah, I think you lost. And like like uh, um, Kenny Wallace said, I think it bothered people that you lost Dale Earnhardt, you lost you know Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, and I think it hurt the fans. So they're like, ah, screw it, I'm not watching it. Tony's not there, or Jeff's not there, or Dale Earnhardt's not there no more. Um, but you got other people. You know, I I think that the racers are just as good. Um, you know, so 
whether it'll ever get back to what it used to be back in 2000, 2003, 2007, um, it may never. Um, that might have been the high of it ever. But, you know, I think the racing is just as good. I think, um, you know, it just needs to pick up pace as far as popularity. Um, I'm into everything. I'm into the F1. I'm into Supercross. I love MotoGP. Um, and occasionally I'll watch some MMA, MMA fighting. But Supercross to me is is what I enjoy the most because that's really physical, mental, everything. It is. And, and you know, I, I like that you mentioned you like all these motorsports. You know, I, I don't think people think, you know, oh, he's he's a former NASCAR driver. He probably only watches NASCAR, only watches this yeah. or that. But I like that you're a multifaceted race driver and a multifaceted uh, race fan as well. Uh, my next question, it's it's a question I'm sure you get quite a lot. Uh, and and we, we touched on it um, a little bit earlier. But but 2003, you guys, you guys are really fast. Uh, we mentioned your, your really good qualifying run at Darlington. And then you go to the track we were just at in, in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, you know your your racing career and, and your life kind of changed there in, in a split second. You know, in an instant that I'm I'm sure we've seen all over the highlight reels and everywhere, unfortunately. But um, uh, if you don't mind, Jerry, just kind of take us through that whole morning. You know, maybe those those laps because you know in, in practice there you're probably not thinking that that instant's going to happen. You're just running practice laps, giving feedback to your crew chief and your team, just kind of. Take us through that whole experience and 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 that that experience of going from from the highest of highs, having a really fast race car, to all of a sudden, you know, I don't know what well, my future in racing is going to be. Th this is the wonders of brain injury, and the wonders of brain injury is that it made me forget about everything that happened that day. Um, all I'm going by is what people were saying, and uh, I know that. It was a great weekend. I know we qualified, I think, uh, ninth or 10th. And I know that we were the fastest in practice. Um, and I don't know what else. I, I'm only going by what people are saying. I think a lot of people were telling me that I wanted to park the car. Um, and I think we still wanted to try out some shocks. And we came in and changed some shocks. And in the next minute, I'm in, I guess I'm in the wall and I, and they flew me away. Um, yeah, I don't remember anything. I don't remember. I remember a little bit in the morning. I think I remember breakfast, but that's it. Um, and it, I think what happens is God does wonders. And I think God makes you forget about those things. Um, and yeah, so it happened. Um, you know, that's kind of how my whole life's been. You know, I was kind of too much on the go. I wish I had somebody kind of pulling my reins a little bit like Jerry stop, relax. Don't, you don't need to go faster. Um, so yeah, um, I was more and less trying to make an impression with the team. And I think I was really excited about the U S army and I was really excited about Ryan Pemberton who unfortunately we lost Ryan a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, because of circumstances internal. Uh, so yeah, I miss, I miss Ryan a lot. Um, and yeah, I hate, I hate what happened because we had such a really good deal going on with the U S army, with MB2 motorsports, with that Jay Fry, who is now with Indy cars. Um, yeah, it was a bad deal. And unfortunately I had to go through it and now, um, you know, 20, 21, 22 years later, I'm still here and I'm still trying to figure out where I'm going. <laughs> well, hey, the, the biggest thing out of that that you just said is that you are still here. And I think you're certainly still here for a reason because there's people around you that, that still love you and people around you that, that certainly are glad that, that you're still with us. And I know NASCAR fans are because your story is one that's been told a lot. Your story is one of, of perseverance and resilience. And I'll say this, as somebody that the worst physical pain I've ever endured uh, is, a, is a minor knee surgery. You know, hardly any of us are ever going to know what it's like. And, and and you said it yourself, you know, you don't really remember everything, the circumstances surrounding that crash. Um, how are you able, you know, in, in those days where everything seems so bleak, you know, you say, my racing career is done. You know, I'm, I'm injured. I'm in pain. I'm, I'm hurting. Nobody understands really what I'm going through. 
how are you able in that position to to be positive? How are you able to find that strength to keep going? Because this isn't something that just applies to racers. This applies to people everywhere. How are you able in that horrible position you were you know you were in uh, to to find the strength to keep going? Where two decades later you're sitting here uh, talking to me, having a good time doing this interview. Yeah, no, I well, I put on a good face, I guess. I think about it, and I think I wonder why nothing. Well, seriously, I'm going to go back. Um, my kids, if it wasn't for my kids and my wife today, I don't know where I would be. Um, it's been it's been uh, a really really difficult uh, 21 years trying to find myself. Um, if it wasn't for my kids and my wife. Uh, I don't know where I'd be. Um, I'm still trying to figure out where I need to be, where where, where I need to go. I know I I'm looking forward to going to Millbridge Speedway uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I built a good relationship with Jeremy and, and Ashley over there, and so yeah, you'll see me at the speedways there as many times as as I can. Um, and I also work at PTC, which is Polecat Training Center in uh, Lynchburg, Tennessee. We have uh, Skip Barber cars. That's kind of where I started. I started out in the Skip Barber series years ago at Lime Rock Park in Connecticut. So uh, when Paul Arnold uh, called me to go over there and see those guys, and I've been there for the last three years, and I absolutely love it. It's a long ride. It's seven hours from my house to the track. But, uh, you know, the fortunate thing is it's only once a month, maybe twice at times. Um, I'll go there and I'll spend four days and work. Uh, so yeah, I, I just try to stay optimistic, hoping that maybe one day Jerry, okay, here's your new deal. I don't know. I don't know when that will happen, but I'm okay. Um, uh, it's good to see my, my kids and my wife smile and, and keep going. Uh, they may not, they may not be smiling. I think they're more excited when I go work. <laughs> I, I do kind of. Uh, put a little bit of hindrance on them when I'm home because I'm what do I do I get kind of mean and and aggravated at times but all in all I'm I'm still happy I'm still smiling and uh, I'm actually going to meet a, a fella who used to sponsor me uh, back when I used to run the modifieds in Connecticut he's out here visiting his son from college and we're going to go have dinner tonight so I just stay moving, uh, you know, stay optimistic. Uh, my mother lives down the, not far from me and, um, went to the mountains yesterday for Easter and saw my sister. I just keep moving. Well, that's, that's great. And that's great advice, you know, just keeping, keep moving and, and keep that optimism. And I love, you mentioned your wife and your kids, you know, that's what it's all about, right? Seeing those people that, that love you, seeing your loved ones and close ones too, you know, they will keep you going in, uh, in times like that, the, the toughest yeah. of times, the times that you faced, uh, it's a really, really good lesson to learn, really special message from you there, sir. Thank you so much for joining the show and, and taking the time to, to talk about everything today. I know you've heard some of these questions a lot. You know, some of them maybe you haven't heard, but we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this with us this afternoon. Yeah, and I do want to say one thing. If anybody ever has a chance and that wants to go learn how to race or maybe even do some lapping with me, um, I'm at Polecat, race, Polecat Training Center. It's in uh, Lynchburg, Tennessee, home of Jack Daniels. I don't know if you guys drink whiskey. But it's a great place to go learn how to race. We have a 2.3 mile road course. Um, there's literally four, I think, 4,000 people in this whole little town. But we have a badass road course, and we have like 30 Skip Barber Formula Fords. So if you guys ever want to come out and do some training and do some practicing and do some lapping, uh, please look us up. We'll be sure to do that, sir. Thank you so much for joining the show. And uh, we wish you uh, we wish you nothing but the best here as you move forward. All right. Thank you. Take care.